everybody. I'm Catherine Whitney. I'm Philbrook's Chief Curator and Curator of American Art. I'm also the co-curator of our exhibition that we're going to bring to your home, into your bedroom, into your living room. It's called Tulsa Treasures, Private Collections and Public. Now our definition of public has changed significantly in the last two weeks. So we're trying to adapt, we're trying to keep you all home and safe and show you this amazing exhibition. It's really a community-centered collection. The curators went to about 50 different homes across our community, asked people why they collect, and we got a range of answers and some amazing objects. Philbrook has done this type of show, um, kind of a Tulsa Collects show in the past, about six times since 1953, but this time we really wanted to cast our net much wider and not look at just sort of in, um, historically important, aesthetically rare paintings and sculpture furniture, but we wanted to reach more people across our community and so included our objects like historic Japanese tin robots, uh, music ephemera, historic toys, uh, circus um, objects, as well as really important works of art. So um, I'll give you a quick overview on the who, what, why, and the takeaway, and then we'll go in and have a virtual tour. So um, I, as I said, we've done this show in the past, and um, it's been about two decades since we did it, um, but the show really brings together some of the most fascinating objects from across our community and some of these have never before been seen in public. Um, we, through the eyes of our area collectors and their objects that they obsessively collect, we really wanted to kind of examine the idea of why do people collect? What's the purpose of collecting? How does it help? Um, we talked to collectors maybe that you wouldn't expect. Artists are collectors, school teachers, scientists, entrepreneurs and we gathered over 900 objects, which was more than we bargained for, um, that range from ancient to contemporary, um, as I said, sort of uh, heirlooms and precious objects to um, kind of quirky circus toys. And we realized when we asked people, why do you collect? We came up with a range of responses that are sort of sprinkled throughout the exhibition with both why they collect, what they collect, and advice for other uh, would-be collectors, um, but we also noticed there were sort of four main categories or kind of collector motivations, and that really helped structure the exhibition for us. So um, the big takeaway for the show, I think, is that there's no one way to collect or one type of object to buy. The collecting is really a very personal, creative endeavor that we can all enjoy. It's something we can do while we're in social isolation and you're at home. You know, you have a relationship with these objects. Objects can sort of be metaphors for your personal stories or your community stories. So maybe you can get something together at home while we're in this strange time. Curate it yourself, photograph it, uh, journal it and that will serve as a memory of how we all got through this and we will. So let's go in the show. So we wanted to really kind of evoke this idea of domestic interior because all of these objects come from people's homes. We started with the front introductory wall with this fun wallpaper, and this actually took a long time to select. We all had very different views of what we wanted, but we wanted something that was kind of fun and energetic, like the show itself is. Um, we also start with this dog by British artist Nick Johnson called Lurcher, because who doesn't want to come home to a friendly dog that doesn't smell that you don't need to clean up, right? This is an amazing um, life-size wood sculpture, and the collector who has this also had a 10-foot camel, but we didn't want to trouble with a lift and all the time and expense of maybe knocking out a wall to get that here. So uh, we also, to set this kind of domestic tone, we have this wonderful rustic door that belonged to Dana Gilpin, who is a local artist in town. And she decorated this door with milagros. And those are sort of tin votive objects and charms that are actually supposed to bring health and uh, votive offerings. And her dear friend, who's also an artist, Pat Gordon, um, asked her family after Gilpin unexpectedly passed away in 2018 if he could have this door of her collected Milagros. So now he has this in his hallway at home as a fellow artist and as a tribute to his dear friend. So moving into the first section, which is called Passion Projects, 
it really looks at how the objects we collect, sometimes really obsessively, define who we are or maybe what we do. Um, as I said, not every collector is what you might expect. We start with a lot of artists who collect and trade with their friends or collect objects to inspire their own works of art. Cynthia Marcoux is one of the first artists. You can see her marionettes, which she collects and then puts into her beautiful, realistic um, pencil drawings. And she also uses a lot of uh, treated photographs in her work. Cynthia says that um, circus and fun and um, kind of um, objects of her nine-year-old self are sort of her muse. And she paints things and works with things that make her happy. She goes to flea markets, she collects things, she's got this kind of odd, um, fun, kind of kitschy um, aesthetic, but her house is just jam-packed full of stuff and it's, it's incredible to go through. So we really had a hard time only picking a very few of her circus objects that, uh, again, that she often paints or photographs in her own work. Chris Ramsey's collection recollection table is probably the perfect object for this show. Many of you might know Chris as the interim head at OSU right now in the art department. And Chris has collected natural objects, found objects, baseball cards, shells, um, things in a semi-state of decay from his boyhood years all the way up to 2006 when he made this recollection table. Um, the objects that he collected put together form a completely new work of art. So recollection kind of has double meaning. Recollection meaning that these objects are recollections of time periods, of interests of his, of places he's visited, national parks, uh, boyhood years, but also by combining them, he sort of repurposed them into a completely new work of art. This is something that you can stare at for many, many minutes or longer. And as I said, I think it's the perfect, perfect object to represent what collecting means and can be, especially to artists. Pat Gordon, as I mentioned, in relation to the Dana Gilpindor, is a very beloved realist artist here in town, known for his multi-layered realist still lives. There's always a lot of subtext and it's kind of sarcasm and um, fun uh, personal references in his works. This Fat Nixon painting, you can see that he used these funny foam wigs that he collected from Target and um, incorporated them into his own works. He also collects these mini monuments and sometimes one of the collecting parameters for him is something small that he can put in his pocket or that will fit on this demi loon table. So if this isn't a collection, I don't know what is. So when we went into these homes and visited people, we had no idea what we were going to find. And sometimes we knew there was a work of art that we were looking for, but we got very distracted by something else that was kind of obsessive or fun. So we'll go on to another contemporary artist here in town who's well known and beloved, um, Otto Decker. And you might know Otto Decker for his hyper-realistic still lives, jackets. Um, he's been working for many, many years, but he has this kind of fun obsession with his wife of collecting these automata, which are these kind of British mechanical objects that are finely crafted in wood. They crank and they have these really funny little humorous things that happen. Um, he, when Otto talks about this, his eyes sparkle like a little boy and he giggles. And so we're, we're, we're going to ask if maybe we can do another session with him demonstrating his mechanical, his cabaret mechanical theater objects, which he adores. Um, another artist, Jean Ann Fowser, um, who is a textile artist in town and um, known for her collection of craft. She and her husband, Tom, also had a children's bookstore for many years. And so not only with her artist's um, career, but also with their professional career as children book, children's booksellers, they collected original illustrations from some of the illustrators whom they represented. And then Linda Pearson, many of you may know as a longtime art dealer here in town who's represented Oklahoma artists and has collected arts of the Southwest. I think it's really fascinating when you have an arts professional, either a curator, a museum person, an artist, or an art dealer, and you say, what do they take home? What do they have in their home collection? And they either just can't sell 
um, feel they need to hang on to, which is probably not the best decision for an art dealer, but what do they take home? What's really precious for them and why can't they part with some of these objects? And in addition to art professionals, this section also has some entrepreneurs and business people whose um, business might have been informed by their collection. So in this case, we have Benita Cooper, um, known by, she goes by Coop, and many of you may know her for her shop in the historic Greenwood district. It's called Silhouette um, Sneakers and Art. And ever since she was a teenager, Coop says that she's collected these cool kicks that really um, made her feel like a cool kid. And she said she got into the stories and the designs of Air Jordans and um, sneakers and really became captivated by, by these designs and the whole culture of sneakers. And her friend was like, why don't you just go into business? So she did. So she collects some really historic works from the 70s as well as very, very contemporary new things. And this is art that you can wear, obviously. And she does, which is great. There are also some custom-made works here as well that certain artists might custom make that reference Greenwood and Tulsa. So just as a teaser, I'm going to walk you through the second section, which is called Preserving the Past, because collecting obviously uh, preserves the past. Um, it's a way to honor, to protect, and to um, preserve objects of our personal stories as well as our community stories. This is something that my colleague Susan Green is going to go into much more detail on April 8th, or stay tuned and, and watch Facebook to see when that's scheduled for. But there is so much great music ephemera in here from Leon Russell and Keynes to historic toys. And I just want to kind of give you a little taste of it and also give you a flash of even the Art Deco objects that obviously are very much about specific to Tulsa and our regional histories that are so important to preserve. The next section is, we had trouble naming this one actually, it's called Arts for Art's Sake. And it really looks at the tendency for many sort of traditional collectors, if you will, to collect objects of historic or aesthetic value to hang in their home. So these are objects that people chase at auction, they might go to art galleries to get, they might trade, uh, they might have inherited them in their family, but they're things that we think of as a little bit more um, personally significant to these collectors for whatever reason. This has a huge range of very ancient objects in 3D to very contemporary modern works by Andy Warhol of significant figures like Mao Zedong and Marilyn Monroe. These historic objects here date to the second and third century and the Gandahar region, which is currently Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I love this quote from this collector, which I'm going to have to read, because when asked why you collect, what's significant about it, and what advice would you give, he said, I collect because I love art, and I collect to eventually give my collection to Philbrook. I adv uh, my advice to collectors is to look at the auction sites and monitor the sale prices. Sorry, I had to put that in there. <laughs> this is also um, a Qing Dynasty piece, a censer, and um, the collector here told us that his grandfather uh, won this in a poker game in Alaska in the 1890s. So these objects not only have historic significance, they have great stories. Everything in this collection and everything in everybody's home collection, they have stories and that's why we love them, they preserve them. You might know Alexander Hoag as a really significant painter from this region known as the Dust Bowl painter, but he painted well into um, many decades later. This is a work from the late 70s of Big Bend and it's just electric, it almost feels radioactive and it's one of the most stunning pieces in this exhibition and it really holds its own as an Oklahoma painter against you know, people from across the decades and across the world. We also have significant works of American Impressionism, early American Modernism in our community, which makes us all very, very um, 
proud that we have these significant works by prominent American painters like George Lux, who is associated with an early modern group called the Ashcan Artists, and also Charles Hossum, who's, you might recognize his name from a work we have in Philbrook's collection. I also want to point out this incredible roll top desk. It's a French 18th century, comes from about 18, excuse me, 1780s, and it was produced during the time of Marie Antoinette by a furniture maker who combined the styles of Louis XV, which was this very kind of elaborate, almost rococo, beautiful um, curving inlay with the straight lines and um, logic, you might say, of Louis XVI style when there was an emphasis on mathematics and logic. This is an opulent, incredible piece that this collector is crazy for. He just wrote us the most elaborate, passionate emails about what he felt about this desk and why he collected it. And it is really, as he said, it's worthy of a sovereign. And it was by uh, Ferdinand Burry, who was a contemporary of a desk maker and cabinet maker who did a very famous desk for Marie Antoinette that's now in the Louvre. The final section of our exhibition is called Supporting Artists and Looking Forward. And this is a section that I think is, in some cases, maybe the most important. I mean, preserving our past is significant, yes, but I think especially in our current situation, it's really important to support artists and creative makers. And a lot of the collectors who buy works of art allow artists to keep working, and they may also contribute to a community's artistic um, environment by donating works to a museum, which in, can enhance the artist's reputation and visibility, and in turn helps the museums, helps the collectors, it's sort of a win-win. I think it's also, um, we want to emphasize, important to sort of stay up with contemporary trends in art and with the world, and what better way to do that with artists who are expressing a lot of contemporary issues or um, collectors who want to champion um, social causes through art. We had just zoomed in on an Amy Hill piece over here that is a wonderful and very funny piece that's also in the collection of Otto Decker. And if you think about a lot of the Northern Renaissance portraits of merchants with the cities in the background with high, fine detail, he's kind of spoofing that with a, a young girl in her urban environment with a Starbucks cup in her hand. So imagine that in our Crest Gallery with some of our other pieces. Again, Otto loves humor and art. And a lot of the pieces in this room are by global artists, Frank right? Bowling, um, Quentin Shen, Chinese artists. We have a South Korean artists, and also um, some fun works by um, an artist over here, Faith Coyote, who is a Navajo artist. This um, collector who we borrowed from in town went to visit this family of artists, and everybody in the family was creating art, including Faith, who was a young teenage, preteen girl at the time when she did this painting called The Oddball. And the collector felt it was very important to support the family and to continue that, um, continue, um, basically encourage their artistic practices, including the daughter. So um, I think that's another important point to make about this section. We'll zoom in on one or two more things. I just want to also reference a quote from a collector who said, it's exciting to get in on the ground floor of an artist's career and help elevate their work so that more people know it exists. So again, not only supporting local, national, international artists, but helping the entire art ecosystem of our community. This is a Jeff Dodd painting by a owned by a local collector, and Jeff is an Oklahoma-based artist who went to Santa Fe for many years, and he really combines realism with fantasy and has these incredibly almost photorealist paintings with incredible texture that have these very odd tones. It's kind of like that's Snow White in the woods. I 
want to point out the incredible detail and texture of um, Soon Jeong Min's piece. This is a South Korean contemporary artist who uses an ancient, uh, very nationally um, celebrated technique in South Korea of hinge, which is a way to use the inner bark of the mulberry tree, and then it's hammered out and enameled and made very, very firm and rolled. So you get these beautiful little elements of rolled paper then put together and it has almost this ripple effect if you stand away and it feels almost like water or fire. And this is both painting and sculpture at the same time by an artist that has contemporized a very ancient national art form. Lastly, I wanna to point to these wonderful locust pieces by John Eric Rees. And this collector is also the same collector who had the Mao piece by Andy Warhol and also the dog when we first came in. So you can see that collectors don't necessarily stay to one type of collecting or one genre of art. Uh, this collector also feels it's extremely important to collect uh, living artists and support them. But he basically told us when we came to visit, he said, I know when the hair on the back of my neck stands up that I'm in trouble and I have to try to buy something. So you know, why do we collect? What pushes us that way? There's, you know, what, what causes joy? What causes awe? What has personal significance to you and why? And objects, as I said, tend to be metaphors for our personal stories or talk about our pasts or maybe talk about our future hopes or maybe just make the ordinary really spectacular, which is definitely the case with Reese, who uses corals, thread, metallic, tapestries, freshwater pearls, crystals, and he weaves these incredible tapestries out of all these materials. And again, it's just a common locust, but blown up large and made spectacular. So I hope you've enjoyed this tour. I am sorry you can't be here in person, but we'll get there. And um, please tune in on August 8th when my colleague Susan Green or actually check Facebook to see when we're gonna post it. She'll give you a detailed examination of the preserving the past with all the fun historic tin robots and the music ephemera from Keynes in the church studio, and it's not to be missed. So thank you guys, stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you when all this is over.